And she's heading to the employees only section. She's got a side of beef. Looks like Paget's got a whole bluefin tuna. Looks like an industrial deli slicer. And Paget somehow got a hold of a full cash register. Oh no! Oh boy, Paget now taking Melanie's personal items. And wait. Whoa, 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 what's she doing? This is not a television game show about winning a prize by aggressively hoarding as many groceries as possible into a shopping cart. No, this is the real story of Zionists and their doctrinal claim. Licensing the colonization and appropriation of foreign Arab lands that never belonged to them. Land that Zionists still assert were promised to them by God many millennia ago. But the question is, from a real geographic sense, where does this promise begin and where does it end? When confronted that it does indeed aspire to an expansion far beyond its current lands, Israel's typical response to this accusation is that such a notion is a conspiratorial concoction by the Arabs to drive fear into their own people, as well as put the international community on alert towards any potential Israeli military engagement. Just another big lie in line with the protocols of the elders of Zion. Israel would then double down with official statements that it has no further inclinations to gain more territories. All we would hear was the repetitious slogan that the Jewish nation had rightfully obtained what God had originally promised it. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram and said, To your offspring I give this land, from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates. Okay, so what was this promise? How does it reflect on today's geopolitical borders? First impressions are that the lands promised by God were edged in the east by the Euphrates River meaning territories in Jordan, Syria, and Iraq, all the way west, bordered by the Mediterranean Sea and the Nile River, and finally southwards towards a section of Saudi Arabia. Right? Not so fast. There is a little more to it. Apparently, the promise was a bit elastic, and hence my analogy to the frenzied shopping game show. You see, God didn't promise a defined piece of property to the Jews. What God said to Joshua was to go out and take as much as you can from an identified geographical allocation, to grab as much of the groceries as possible and to dump them into his shopping cart, to lead the conquest of the lands that would result in the ultimate prize, a tangible promised land. And that's why till today, some Jews have a bone to pick with Joshua. They believe he was not as proactive as he should have been in broadening the landscapes of the promised land. These Jews do indeed feel entitled that their bequeathed piece of land should have been exponentially larger. And if we proceed along history and note the subsequent Jewish kingdoms and the lands they controlled, from King David to King Solomon and finally King Herod, we come to see that the extents of these Jewish governed lands revolved around the same areas that Joshua had annexed. One side consideration I'll have to make is a correction concerning the assumption by many regarding the borders of the lands that God promised to Abram and his next of kin. Most assume that the river in Egypt suggests the Nile. But this is incorrect. If we review the words that God spoke, he states clearly, the river of Egypt, while at the same time qualifying the Euphrates as the great river. These two main rivers being equal in significance meant that the river in Egypt wasn't the Nile, but was more likely a smaller body of water, a brook in the Wadi of Egypt. This clarification is also further enforced by Theodore Herzl in his diaries, where he refers to Jewish lands as being from the brook of Egypt to the Euphrates. So where am I going with all of this? Okay, since I just brought up Herzl, the father of Zionism, let's continue on with more Zionists who reinforce this notion that the Promised Land isn't aligned with what are currently the borders of the State of Israel. Rabbi Feishman, member of the Jewish Agency for Palestine, declared in his testimony to the United Nations Special Committee for Palestine on June 9, 1947, the Promised Land extends from the river of Egypt to the Euphrates. It includes parts of Syria and Lebanon. Government officials from across the Israeli political landscape make regular claims that depict an aspired expansion of Greater Israel, such as the finance minister Bezalel Smotrich, whose public speech in France was overshadowed by his selection of an idealized map of Israel on his podium that included Jordan and parts of Syria and Lebanon. The same map that was the logo of the Irgun, a Zionist expansionist terrorist paramilitary organization or the author, politician, and public speaker, Avi Lipkin, whose claims don't stop with God's promised lands, but go way further beyond. Eventually, our borders will extend from Lebanon, the Great Desert, which is Saudi Arabia, and then from the Mediterranean 
to the Euphrates. And who's on the other side of the Euphrates? The Kurds. And the Kurds are our friends. So we have the Mediterranean behind us, the Kurds in front of us, Lebanon, which really needs the umbrella of protection of Israel. And then we're going to take, I believe, we're going to take uh, Mecca, Medina, and Mount Sinai and well, pu purify those places. And there are many more extremist examples sharing these same sentiments along the past decades. And surprisingly, from those whom the West concedes as supposedly civilized, democratic, and open-minded. What I'm trying to convey is that there are precedents and thoughts and actions that represent the claims of Israel towards the annexation of lands beyond what was granted to them by UNSCOP in 1947. They existed in the past from the outset of Zionism till the present day, when there are those now in power who call for the retaking of a much larger promised land. Israel was purely established as a nation based on a theological premise of a several thousand year old promise by God to the Jewish people. So fundamentally, it was and is okay to use this rationale to achieve any such future geopolitical aspirations. Systematically, through wars or settlement, Israel has grown to almost double its size since its establishment. Gaza and the West Bank will soon, in their entirety, follow suit. Annihilated and then colonized. All signs lead to this desired end result. Regardless of the nonsensical notions of a single or two-state solution, the Golan Heights, a disputed Syrian zone, has already been taken over by Israel and is witnessing substantial colonization. You'd say to me, how can this be true? Israel gave up Sinai and the Camp David Accords in 1978, and then the West Bank and Gaza Strip in the Oslo Accords of 1993. Well, I would say that these were miscalculated and momentary glitches by a few who are now viewed upon as the modern Joshuas, those who gave up rightful Jewish land. And one can't deny that Israel has a track record of further incursions into Arab lands. Israel's invasions of Lebanon beginning in 1978, with further recurrences in 1982 between 1985 to 2000 and in 2006, exhibit how easy it is for Zionist expansionists to cross the borders of a weaker neighboring Arab nation. Lebanon, a country in tatters with no government and no real global support, is primed for an eventual overrun. Of course, with the claims that Lebanon as per scripture, always belong to the Jewish people with some additional sprinklings of some sort of existential crisis. Which brings us to the general state of affairs for the other possible potential victims who border Israel, namely Syria and Jordan, both of whom are fragile, either due to an ongoing civil war or on the brink of a monarchical system ready to collapse. Let's not forget, both Syria and Jordan have been named repeatedly as lands that belong to a larger and greater Israel. Finally, Egypt, the most powerful of the Arab nations. What is its fate when it comes to Zionist expansionism? One simple word, Sinai. Post-1967 Six-Day War, Sinai and Egyptian territory came under Israeli occupation up until 1978. Sinai has always been a strategic asset that is too valuable to leave in the hands of the Egyptians. The overtaking of Sinai is currently remote, but what is fact is that its importance to Israel and the West has implications that would easily justify striking at an opportune time, say when Egypt might be struggling with its own internal unrest. So am I saying that Israel has intentions to invade and take control of all these lands and countries? Like a new Israeli kingdom? Of course not. But there are certain elements of these nations that will for sure imminently fall within the territories of a greater Israel due to either political aspirations or the hoarding of natural resources, with the Arab world left to deal with the remnants of those nations. Let me take you through my personal assessment of what will be included within an ideal Zionist endgame. Phase 1, the Gaza Strip, the West Bank and the Golan Heights will be assimilated in their entirety with a full expulsion of all Syrians and Palestinians, meaning 5 million plus refugees flowing into Jordan, Syria and Egypt. The next victim will be South Lebanon, as the first phase of Israel's incursion into the troubled nation due to claims of a looming existential crisis, requiring the immediate wiping out of Hezbollah, a la Hamas method. In phase two, as the region struggles with the refugee crisis and neighboring Arab nations begin to show further cracks in their stability, Israel continues on with its invasion of Lebanon to reach Beirut. Further Lebanese refugees are created, Jordan is destabilized and becomes an easy opportunity for Israel to claim its lands for its own, from the Jordan Valley in the north all the way down south to the port of Aqaba. 
In phase three, the collapse of Lebanon is complete. Israel overruns the entire nation. Syria begins to dismantle as a singular nation. Israel overtakes the mountain ranges west of Damascus, linking to the Golan Heights in the south. By this time, military engagement across the Israeli-Egyptian border with the presence of refugees has reached boiling point. Egypt attempts to defend the invasion of Sinai, but Israel and its allies overpower the weakened Egyptian forces. So why these lands? What substantiates this necessity for Israel? Strategic ascendance, for sure, but driving this will mainly be population growth and the associated natural resource requirements over the next five to six decades. Consider it a warning. What I state is not so far-fetched. It is based on a behavioral assessment of how far Israel would go morally and ethically to either, as it always states, survive or to fulfill a biblical promise. Justification of the displacement of one nation of people through a mix of theological Canaan, political strategy and colonialist agenda has already taken place. It became a reality upon the creation of Israel. So who can confidently say that this won't be condoned again? Who would stand up to such incursions? The Arab nations or the West, who to this day justify Israel's deeds of inhumanity? This is not a scenario that is unavoidable. The major action needed to be taken not by Arab or civilized nations or their leaders, but by regular people, the masses, by humanity, is to continue to oppose injustice, to call out the heinous crimes when they're committed, to confront the hypocrites when they appear, to make sure that no one forgets the struggle of the weak and the helpless, and to never ever say that one voice can make no mark.